Hey, fifth grade, it's Mrs. Domino coming to you again with another chapter from The Lightning Thief, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book one. Uh, we are on chapter 10. I am reading to you with permission from Disney Publishing. The book is written by Rick Riordan, who deserves all the credit for the amazing book that he's written. Actually, it's an amazing series. Um, so um, we left off. Percy and Annabeth and Grover are going to go on a quest. They need to get Zeus's lightning bolt because, oh my goodness, everybody thinks that Percy's the one that stole the lightning bolt. We know that he's not, but that's what Zeus thinks, and everybody's mad at him. So I am going to get right in, not wasting any time. Chapter 10, I ruin a perfectly good bus. It didn't take me long to pack. I decided to leave the minotaur horn in my cabin, which left me only an extra change of clothes and a toothbrush to stuff in a backpack Grover had found for me. The camp store loaned me $100 in mortal money and 20 golden drachmas. These coins were as big as Girl Scout cookies and had images of various Greek gods stamped on one side and the Empire State Building on the other. The ancient mortal drachmas had been silver, Chiron told us, but Olympians never used less than pure gold. Chiron said the coins might come in handy for non-mortal transactions, whatever that meant. He gave Annabeth and me each a canteen of nectar and a Ziploc bag full of ambrosia squares, to be used only in emergencies, if we were seriously hurt. It was god food, Chiron reminded us. It would cure us of almost any injury, but it was lethal to mortals. Too much of it would make a half-blood very, very feverish. An overdose would burn us up, literally. Annabeth was bringing her magic Yankees cap, which she told me had been a 12th birthday present from her mom. She carried a book on famous classical architecture written in ancient Greek to read when she got bored, and a long bronze knife hidden in her shirt sleeve. I was sure the knife would get us busted the first time we went through a metal detector. Grover wore his fake feet in his pants to pass as human. He wore a green Rasta-style cap because when it rained, his curly hair flattened and you could just see the tips of his horns. His bright orange backpack was full of scrap metal and apples to snack on. In his pocket was a set of reed pipes his daddy goat had carved for him, even though he only knew two songs. Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 12 and Hilary Duff's So Yesterday, both of which sounded pretty bad on reed pipes. We waved goodbye to the other campers, took one last look at the strawberry fields, the ocean, and the big house, then hiked up Half-Blood Hill on the tall pine tree that used to be Talia, daughter of Zeus. Chiron was waiting for us in his wheelchair. Next to him stood the surfer dude I'd seen when I was recovering in the sick room. <coughs> Excuse me. According to Grover, the guy was the camp's head of security. He supposedly had eyeballs, sorry, eyes all over his body, so he could never be surprised. Today, though, he was wearing a chauffeur's uniform so I could only see extra peepers on his hands, face, and neck. This is August, Chiron told me. He will drive you into the city and, uh, well, keep an eye on things. <laughs> Do you get why that's punny? That's a pun. He's got eyes all over him. He's going to keep an eye on things. I heard footsteps behind us. Luke came running up the hill carrying a pair of basketball shoes. Hey, glad I caught you, he panted. Annabeth blushed, the way she always did when Luke was around. Just wanted to say good luck, Luke told me, and I thought, um, maybe you could use these. He handed me the sneakers, which looked pretty normal. They even smelled kind of normal. Luke said, Maya! White bird's wings sprouted out of the heels, startling me so much, I dropped them. The shoes flapped around on the ground until the wings folded up and disappeared. Awesome, Grover said. Luke smiled. Those served me well when I was on my quest. Gift from Dad. Of course, I don't use them much these days. His expression turned sad. I didn't know what to say. It was cool enough that Luke had come to say goodbye. I'd been afraid he might resent me for getting so much attention the last few days, but... Here he was, giving me a magic gift. It made me blush almost as much as Annabeth. Hey, man, I said. Thanks. Listen, Percy. Luke looked uncomfortable. A lot of hopes are riding on you, so just uh, kill some monsters for me, okay? We shook hands, 
Luke patted Grover's head between his horns, then gave a goodbye hug to Annabeth, who looked like she might pass out. After Luke was gone, I told her, You're hyperventilating. Am not. You let him capture the flag instead of you, didn't you? Oh, why do I want to go anywhere with you, Percy? She stopped down the other side of the hill where a white SUV waited on the shoulder of the road. Argus followed, jingling his car keys. I picked up the flying shoes and had a sudden bad feeling. I looked at Chiron. I won't be able to use these, will I? He shook his head. Luke meant well, Percy, but taken to the air, that would not be wise for you. I nodded, disappointed, but then I got an idea. Hey, Grover, you want a magic item? His eyes lit up. Me? Pretty soon we'd lace the sneakers over his fake feet, and the world's first flying goat boy was ready for launch. Maya! He shouted. He got off the ground okay, but then fell over sideways so his backpack dragged through the grass. The winged shoes kept bucking up and down like tiny broncos. Practice! Chiron called after him. You just need practice! Ah! Grover went flying sideways down the hill like a possessed lawnmower heading toward the van. I'm sorry, I have to stop for that imagery. That simile is fantastic. Grover went flying down the hill like a possessed lawnmower. Before I could follow, Chiron caught my arm. I should have trained you better, Percy. If only I had more time. Hercules, Jason, they all got more training. Well, that's okay. I just wish... I stopped myself because I was about to sound like a brat. I was wishing my dad had given me a cool magic item to help on the quest. Something as good as Luke's flying shoes or Annabeth's invisible cap. What am I thinking? Chiron cried. I can't let you get away without this. He pulled a pen from his coat pocket and handed it to me. It was an ordinary disposable ballpoint, black ink, removable cap. Probably cost 30 cents. Gee, I said, thanks. Percy, that's a gift from your father. I've kept it for years, not knowing you were who I was waiting for. But the prophecy is clear to me now. You are the one. I remembered the field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I vaporized Mrs. Dodds. Chiron had thrown me a pin that turned into a sword. Could this be? I took off the cap, and the pen grew longer and heavier in my hand. In half a second, I held a shimmering bronze sword with a double-edged blade, a leather-wrapped grip, and a flat hilt riveted with gold studs. It was the first weapon that actually felt balanced in my hand. The sword has a long and tragic history that we need not go into, Chiron told me. Its name is Anaclusmos. Riptide, I translated, surprised the ancient Greek came so easily. Use it only for emergencies, Chiron said, and only against monsters. No hero should harm mortals unless absolutely necessary, of course, but this sword wouldn't harm them in any case. I looked at the wickedly sharp blade. What do you mean it wouldn't harm mortals? How could it not? The sword is celestial bronze, forged by the Cyclops, tempered in the heart of Mount Edna, cooled in the River Leith. It's deadly to monsters to any creature from the underworld, provided they don't kill you first, but the blade will pass through mortals like an illusion. They simply are not important enough for the blade to kill, and I should warn you, as a demigod, you can be killed by either celestial or normal weapons. You are twice as vulnerable. Good to know. Now recap the pen. I touched the pen cap to the sword tip and instantly riptide shrank to a ballpoint pen again. I tucked it in my pocket, a little nervous because I was famous for losing pens at school. You can't, Chiron said. Can't what? Lose the pen? It's enchanted. It will always reappear in your pocket. Try it. I was wary, but I threw the pin as far as I could down the hill and watched it disappear in the grass. It may take a few moments, Chiron told me. Now check your pocket. Sure enough, the pen was there. Okay, that's extremely cool, I admitted. But what if a mortal sees me pulling out a sword? Chiron smiled. Mist is a powerful thing, Percy. Mist? Yes, 
Read the Iliad. It's full of references to this stuff. Whenever divine or monstrous elements mix with the mortal world, they generate mist which obscures the vision of humans. You will see things just as they are, being a half-blood, but humans will interpret things quite differently. Remarkable, really, the lengths to which humans will go to, to fit things into their version of reality. I put Riptide back in my pocket. For the first time, the quest felt real. I was actually leaving Half-Blood Hill. I was heading west with no adult supervision, no backup plan, not even a cell phone. Chiron said cell phones were traceable by monsters if we used one. It would be worse than sending up a flare. I had no weapon stronger than a sword to fight off monsters and reach the land of the dead. Chiron, I said, when you say the gods are immortal, I mean, there was a time before them, right? Four ages before them, actually. The time of the Titans was the Fourth Age, sometimes called the Golden Age, which is definitely a misnomer. This, the time of Western civilization and the rule of Zeus, is the Fifth Age. So what was it like before the gods? Chiron pursed his lips. Even I am not old enough to remember that child, but I know it was a time of darkness and savagery for mortals. Kronos, the lord of the Titans, called his reign the Golden Age because men lived innocent and free of all knowledge. But that was mere propaganda. The Titan King cared nothing for your kind except as appetizers or a source of cheap entertainment. It was only in the early reign of Lord Zeus, when Prometheus, the good Titan, brought fire to mankind, that your species began to progress, and even then Prometheus was branded a radical thinker. Zeus punished him severely, as you may recall. Of course, eventually the gods warmed to humans, and Western civilization was born. But the gods can't die now, right? I mean, as long as Western civilization's alive, they're alive. So, even if I failed, nothing could happen so bad it would mess up everything, right? Chiron gave me a melancholy smile. No one knows how long the age of the West will last, Percy. The gods are immortal, yes. But then... So were the Titans. They still exist, locked away in their various prisons, forced to endure endless pain and punishment, reduced in power, but still very much alive. May the fates forbid that the gods should ever suffer such a doom, or that we should ever return to the darkness and chaos of the past. All we can do, child, is follow our destiny. Our destiny, assuming we know what that is. Relax, Chiron told me. Keep a clear head, and remember, you may be about to prevent the biggest war in human history. Relax, I said. I'm very relaxed. When I got to the bottom of the hill, I looked back. Under the pine tree that used to be Talia, daughter of Zeus, Chiron was now standing in full horseman form, holding his bow high in salute. Just your typical summer camp sent off by your typical centaur. I'm going to go ahead and stop for the moment on that part of the chapter. I will finish the chapter, um, but I am going to kind of do this one chunked up because it's a super long one. So I hope that this is a nice intro to the next chapter, chapter 10. Stay tuned for another installment. Hope you guys are doing well.